Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, your host here on Last Week in the Church. This is the show where we sort through the flotsam and jetsam of the last week in terms of journalism on the Vatican and try to extract those few nuggets of gold that you absolutely need to know. That, at least, is what my marketing people tell me to say about this show. Whether that's actually what we do, well, that's up to you. We begin this week with Make It Marseille. Pope Francis, over the weekend, took a brief but you know, jam-packed trip to the French port city of Marseille, in which he used his strongest language to date on the migrant and refugee crisis in Europe, issuing a full frontal challenge to many European states. And by the way, this trip marked a historic first in terms of the Pope's meeting with French President Emmanuel Macron, not because the meeting happened, but the context of it will explain what was going on there. Then, Second, we've got media analysis. There was another important element to the Pope's messaging in Marseille, which has largely been ignored by media outlets, both those that lean to the left and those that lean to the right. We'll try to make sense of what appears to be a kind of conspiracy of silence about a certain aspect of what the Pope had to say. Then third, we've got a scandal turns surreal. So, Former Jesuit, Father Marco Rupnik, has been accused of sexual abuse of adult women, mostly members of a religious community of which he was sort of the informal patron, that stretch more than 20 women, by the way, stretching over a period of around 30 years. Yet this week, the Pope's own diocese, the Diocese of Rome, essentially gave a clean bill of health to a center in Rome founded by Rupnik and also raised questions about his brief 2020 excommunication. This has caused great consternation and angst among Rupnik's alleged victims. We'll try to make sense to the extent one can of what's going on in this terribly convoluted situation. Fourth, farewell to a friend. Pope Francis, on Sunday after he got back from Marseille, made a brief but historically significant visit to Rome's Palazzo Madama, that's the headquarters of the Italian Senate, to pay respects to former Italian President Giorgio Napolitano, who died on Friday at the age of 98. Now, Napolitano was a close personal friend of both Pope Francis and his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI. We'll try to explain the lessons that Napola, Napolitano's life and the legacy hold for Catholics everywhere. And then finally this week, we've got preview of coming attractions. Folks, buckle in, because for the next month or so, Pope Francis is going to be presiding over essentially the most jam-packed, highly fraught, and complicated period of his entire papacy. We will break down what's going to be going on and what to watch for. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church. So please, for no reason, for absolutely no motive, do not go anywhere. Do not click away. Do not change that dial. Stay where you are because I promise you, you're not going to want to miss what we've got to tell you. So, notoriously, intelligence and wisdom are not the same thing. It is actually possible to be incredibly smart and also incredibly foolish. Footnote, it is also possible to be a total idiot and a great fool. My life is sort of a laboratory experiment in what happens when both of those things are true. But that's not our point here today. Our point here today is that history is replete with examples of the great mischief that can result when intelligence and wisdom become decoupled. If you want a refresher course in this point, by the way, I recommend you go see the brilliant new movie Oppenheimer, which is basically a three-hour meditation on precisely this point. However, the contrary is also true. That is, if disaster is often the result when intelligence and wisdom separate, triumph and amazement is often what happens when intelligence and wisdom come together. And this is a roundabout setup for a naked commercial plug because I'm here today to recommend a new piece of technology to you. It's a new app called Magisterium AI. And basically, it is an effort to combine intelligence, in this case, artificial intelligence, with the great spiritual and ethical wisdom of Catholic teaching. 
it is an app that is by now trained on more than 3,000 official church documents. It is available in 10 languages, so pretty much any tongue you would, you know, wish to get an answer in. And what you can do is you can go on to this app and ask it questions, ranging from really high-end egg-headed stuff to, like, explain the doctrine of transubstantiation or what were the issues in the Arian heresy, all the way down to the kinds of banal things that real people would ask, like, what's the deal with the Pope? Or, you know, the Virgin Mary, do you guys worship her? Like, well, what's the thing? You know, whatever your question is, this tool will give you cogent, insightful, well-written answers. So whether you are a priest who needs talking points for a homily, or you're a CCD teacher who has that one precocious kid in class that won't stop asking you questions, and speaking as the former precocious kid in class, I know how a annoying that slice of life can be. I raised it to a fine art. You know, whatever, you know, whatever your needs may be. I mean, if you're just an ordinary person with questions about the Catholic Church, because, I don't know, you read a Dan Brown novel or you watched Godfather 3 or whatever it is, this tool will be extraordinarily useful to you. It is the brainchild of our friends at Longbeard. That's a digital marketing and design company. They are the IT backbone of the Crux site and also of last week in the church. These people are geniuses. And beyond that, they're also salt of the earth, great people. And so whatever they touch basically turns to gold. This is the latest example of it. I highly recommend it to you. Now, I'm not going to promise that if you, you know, use it, and by the way, you should, it's at magisterium.com. That's magisterium.com. I'm not going to promise you a full refund if you're not satisfied because it's free. So you don't actually have to pay anything. What I will promise is that if you don't like it, you are free to send me a note telling me that. I will use another AI app to generate an automated response in which I have no rule whatsoever. I'm actually just kidding. I would pass your response along because I guarantee you the people at Longbeard want to get this right. So again, check it out. That is Magisterium AI online at magisterium.com. By the way, if this didn't convince you, and frankly, it's me, so why should it convince you? But if you want a more intelligent presentation of the argument for this, read my wife Elise's article on the Crux site. It is replete with insight and elan and verve, and it will lay out the case in very compelling fashion. Magisterium.com, check it out. All right, everybody, welcome back. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, September 26th in the year of our Lord, 2023. We begin this week with Pope Francis's brief but significant weekend trip to the French city of Marseille. Now, you know, this trip had been in the books for quite some time. The ostensible purpose for the Pope going was to preside over the close of a meeting on the Mediterranean region that brought together church leaders and youth and leaders of other Christian churches and other religions from all around the Mare Nostrum, the Mediterranean Sea. It was expected in advance that this would be an opportunity for the Pope to expand upon and put an exclamation point on his message in favor of the human rights and the human dignity of migrants and refugees, and Francis did not disappoint. He began when he got to Marseille on Friday with talking about the Mediterranean as the world's largest open cemetery. This a reference to the roughly 20,000 migrants and refugees who have died since 2014, trying to make the crossing over the Mediterranean to reach Europe. And he also rejected what he called the fanaticism of indifference to the fate of these migrants and refugees. Then on Saturday, he doubled down the Pope publicly in the presence of French President Emmanuel Macron, who has presided over an increasingly hard line position of the French government, and he is not alone. Many other European governments, including the Pope's own backyard of Italy under Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney, have also increasingly taken a strong position against allowing new migrants and refugees to enter Europe. 
the Pope rejected what he called alarmist propaganda about migration. He said that you hear two words a lot. He said you hear the words invasion and you hear the words emergency. He essentially said both are fallacious, both are misleading, and he called for a policy of welcome, acceptance, and integration of migrants and refugees. This, of course, is a position that stands in stark contrast with the policies increasingly being adopted by many European states. Now, one point of interest about all of this is the Pope's meeting with Macron. This is actually the fourth time the French President Macron has met the Pope. The previous three occasions have all been at the Vatican. So this is the first time the Pope met Macron on French soil, even though the Vatican went to pains to stress that this was not a state visit to France. This was instead a papal visit to a meeting on the Mediterranean. Nevertheless, the Pope and Macron did sit down. Now, you know, one interesting footnote about all of this, Italian media sites are full of video of Francis sitting by himself in the room where he and Macron were going to meet for several minutes because Macron apparently was running late. And so he made Francis cool his jets until he actually showed up. This was widely perceived by many people as a kind of Wow, basically a snub. I mean, you don't really keep the Pope waiting. It's just, it's not good manners. But in any event, eventually Macron did show up. The two men had their tete-a-tete. Now, here's what's interesting about all of this, and here's why this is a historical first. This is hardly the first time that a French president has met a Pope. But in the past, every time the head of state in France sat down with the Pope, Politically speaking, this was considered an effort by the French leader to shore up his support on the French right. That is, among conservatives, faith and values voters, right? People who were interested in the Christian identity, the Christian roots of France, and so on. And so typically, a French leader, when he meets a pope, is, you know, looking to boost his stock among conservatives. This was the first time in history that a French president actually met with a pope hoping for help from the left rather than the right. Pope Francis is, after all, the world's leading moral champion of the human dignity of migrants and refugees, and Macron was meeting him at a time when his own government is taking increasingly restrictive positions. Macron has announced that France is not going to be taking any new entrants from North Africa or the Middle East or the other places where migrants and refugees today are coming from. He's actually announced that France will be doubling its military presence on its borders, on its border with Italy to ensure that these people don't make it across the border. Now, all that has generated some criticism in France, particularly from the left that believes it's a betrayal of France's, you know, traditional identity as a society of compassion and welcome and tolerance. And so most observers believe that by meeting with the Pope and by showing such deference to the Pope, despite keeping him waiting for several minutes, that Macron was hoping for a political boost on the left. As I say, that is a remarkable role reversal of what is usually the case when French premiers and popes of the Catholic Church sit down. Now, second, we shift to media analysis. There was another interesting element of Pope Francis's messaging in Marseille, which was largely ignored, actually, by most media agencies that covered this trip. In the Pope's concluding mass in the Velodrome in Marseille, which is essentially the soccer stadium where Marseille's team plays, they play in, you know, the top flight of French soccer, Instead, this day, it was devoted to a papal mass. The Pope, yeah, you know, he once again referenced his concern for migrants, but he was also extremely strong on the issues of euthanasia and abortion. On euthanasia in particular, this is important because the Macron government has announced plans to bring forward a piece of legislation that would authorize essentially assisted suicide 
that is a kind of right to die measure, but they agreed to withhold that until after the Pope had come and gone. So now we are expecting that that measure will be presented and will move forward. The Pope, both on the euthanasia, euthanasia issue and on abortion, that is the fate of the unborn, was extremely strong in his homily at that mass. Then on the flight on the way back to Rome during his traditional in-flight press conference at the end of one of his foreign trips, he returned to the theme. He said more than once with regard to both euthanasia and abortion that you don't mess with life. And he repeated the phrase, you don't mess with life. Now, the question I would ask is, why, don't you, why wouldn't you know any of that from reading coverage in the world's major press agencies. Because the interesting thing is, what virtually every press agency in the world chose to focus on instead of this language on euthanasia and abortion was the Pope's language on Ukraine. He gave a kind of convoluted statement. It was, in essence, a repetition of his long-standing condemnation of the global arms trade. In this case, he said, that it is wrong for some countries to have promised weapons to Ukraine, but then back out. Most people think that's a reference to the fact that Poland has announced that it is going to temporarily suspend, temporarily at least, suspend arms transfers to Ukraine over a trade dispute. But, but the thing of it is, you know, asked for clarification. The Vatican spokesman, Matteo Bruni, issued a statement that really, frankly, didn't clarify much of anything. I mean, what he said was, the Pope's point is that arms merchants, you know, make decisions, but they don't have to live with the consequences. It's the people on the ground who have to live with those consequences, which is, of course, perfectly true, but it doesn't really explain what the Pope was trying to say. Anyway, my point is that it was that bit on Ukraine, which is frankly indecipherable and confusing that press agencies decided to focus on not his very clear and very forceful language on euthanasia and abortion. Now, why is that, do we think? Well, here's what I would suggest. Press agencies that lean to the left like the fact that Pope Francis is perceived as a liberal who isn't engaged in the culture wars over issues such as euthanasia and abortion, so they find it convenient simply to ignore it whenever the Pope does talk on those issues. Now, news agencies that lead to the right, they typically think of Francis as weak on these issues, and so probably would chalk up his rhetoric in Marseille as kind of pro forma lip service that doesn't really mean anything. And in any event, it would undercut their narrative of the Pope as being soft on these issues and sort of insufficiently attentive to them. So what we have is a kind of ideologically driven conspiracy of silence among both liberal and conservative news outlets who kind of imposed a blackout upon what was really, if you do a textual analysis, probably the second most important thing in terms of the amount of attention and the forcefulness of the rhetoric that Pope Francis came to Marseille to talk about. Now, you know, what, is, what does all of that mean? Well, I think what it means is there is a kind of caveat emptor lesson here. Let the buyer beware. When you read news coverage of the Pope, yes, I mean, it is always interesting, but you also have to bear in mind that sometimes the interests, the ideologies, the preferences, even the biases of news outlets will color the way they report and what they choose to report about what the Pope had to say. Such would certainly seem to be the case with the Pope's outing to Marseille. All right, third up this week, we have a scandal turns surreal. So for the last several months, we have been living with the controversies surrounding ex-Jesuit father Marco Rupnik. I say ex because he was kicked out of the Jesuits over the summer in the wake of accusations of sexual abuse against around 20 adult women stretching over a period of about 30 years, which Jesuit investigators said they found, and I'm quoting here, very, very credible. Now, from the beginning, the Pope's own attitude to this case has been a subject of some, well, I guess confusion is the word. 
And that mystery deepened this past week because two things happened. One, early in the week, the Pope granted an audience to an Italian lay theologian woman by the name of Maria Campatelli. Now, her claim to fame is that she has been one of Rupnik's closest collaborators over the years, and publicly she has defended Rupnik frequently and vigorously against these charges of sexual abuse. In fact, she once said publicly that she felt that Rupnik and the, the Centro Aletti that he founded in Rome have been the victims of a media lynching. Again, the word was a lynching. So Pope Francis met with her in the library of the Apostolic Palace where he receives VIP visitors, including heads of state. The Vatican later released photographs of this session, which appeared to be warm and, and you know, positive. And not a word, apparently, was said at least from anything that either the Vatican or Campitelli said afterwards about the abuse charges against Rupnik. Now, that was upsetting on the face of it for many of Rupnik's alleged victims, but what followed was even more sort of concerning because what happened was the Diocese of Rome put out a statement saying that it had conducted an, an investigation of Rupnik's Centro Aletti, that's his artistic center here in Rome, and found that it has a healthy community life with no particular matters of concern. And further, it said that the investigator had reviewed the evidence, the files that led to a brief excommunication of Rupnik in 2020 over a charge that he had used the confessional to absolve a woman with whom he had engaged in sexual activity and doing so is considered a very serious crime under church law. The statement said that the investigator had looked at all that and found grave procedural anomalies that raised questions about whether this excommunication was actually legitimate in the first place. In other words, the takeaway was that the Diocese of Rome under Cardinal Angelo de Donatus, the Pope's vicar from Rome, was essentially saying that Rupnik had been smeared. Now, this created outrage among Rupnik's alleged victims, five of whom signed an open letter to the Pope and to De Donatus and to others in power in the church, basically saying, we are speechless and we are appalled. They said, this convinces us that the Pope's talk about zero tolerance on abuse is nothing more than a PR campaign. And it also convinces us that the church is not at all interested in what victims and survivors of abuse have experienced or what they have to say. Now, you know, the takeaway from all of this is it leaves us utterly perplexed as to what the actual attitude of Pope Francis and his Vatican team are. When the Jesuits kicked Rupnik out in July, saying that they had found the accusations against him very credible, it was widely presumed that they would not have done so without consulting with Pope Francis, who was, of course, himself a Jesuit. And so that was considered, in a way, a kind of indirect papal, what? Agreement that there was something wrong with what Rupnik had done. However, now the Pope's own diocese has essentially given him a good housekeeping seal of approval. And once again, the presumption is they wouldn't have done that either had the Pope not at least been aware of it. So it leaves everyone sort of scratching their heads about what the Pope's real attitude here is. Unfortunately, the very short in-flight press conference on Saturday coming back from Marseille did not create the opportunity to put that question to Pope Francis, but it is a question that the Pope is not going to be able to avoid going forward. Because for all those who are inclined to skepticism or to cynicism, about the Vatican and this Pope's response to the clerical abuse crisis, Rupnik is now Exhibit A. And until the Vatican clarifies what exactly Pope Francis believes about this case and what he intends to do about it, those doubts are not going to go away. All right, fourth up this week, farewell to a friend. Pope Francis on Sunday took the unprecedented step after his noontime Angelus address of getting in a car and driving across Rome to go inside the Palazzo Madama here in Rome, which is the headquarters of the Italian Senate, 
which is where the remains of former Italian President Giorgio Napolitano were lying in state. This in an effort to show respect for Napolitano, a person with whom Pope Francis had actually enjoyed a close friendship. Now, at one level, you might say this is pretty much an Italian story, but it really isn't. There are two aspects of the Napolitano legacy, which are of interest for Catholics everywhere. Number one, Napolitano was a, a non-believer. He was a former leader of Italy's Communist Party who was elected to the Italian Chamber of Deputies in 1953, spent most of his career, actually, as a member of the Communist Party until it finally dissolved, and then he became a key figure in other leftist coalitions in Italian political life, was eventually elected to the presidency in 2006, and then in 2013 became the first Italian president ever to be re-elected to that office, became the longest serving president in the history of the Italian Republic. Now, you know, in the old days, it used to be believed that the Vatican preferred Italians, sorry, the Vatican preferred Catholics in political rules, that if it had to deal with a head of state or an ambassador or a prime minister or whoever, that it would prefer to have a Catholic in that job because the assumption was, well, you know, Catholics would be more likely to be deferential, respectful of the church and its moral and social teaching. Now, the truth of it is, that concept ran out of gas a long time ago. But Napolitano was the ultimate proof of the point. In 2013, when he was, being, when he was up for re-election, the other really strong candidate at that time was Romano Prodi, former head of the European Commission and a former prime minister of Italy, who is a practicing Catholic, a regular mass goer, very close to the church circles in his native Bologna. However, the Vatican made it very clear at the time they didn't really want Prodi because Prodi has had a contentious relationship with the Italian bishops over the years. He once described himself as an adult Catholic, which basically meant, I'll go to church, but I'm not going to take my cues about how to vote from you guys. Napolitano, on the other hand, was actually, despite being a non-believer, far less fraught in terms of how he engaged with church officialdom. It is a reminder that the Vatican, honestly, when it comes to politics, doesn't really care whether you're Catholic. What they want is somebody who is serious and somebody who is respectful of the role that the church plays in public affairs. Beyond that, they're not really interested. Memo to the United States, by the way, we still operated, operate on the antiquated notion that we have to send a Catholic to Rome as our ambassador to the Vatican, because somehow we think the Vatican is going to get upset if we don't send a Catholic. False. And Napolitano makes this point. In fact, in many ways, it would be a lot easier if we didn't send, non if we didn't send Catholics, because then the Vatican doesn't have to worry about their ecclesiastical standing, their relationship with their local bishops, and so on. Also, it expands the talent pool considerably. So the American State Department, take a note from the life and legacy of Giorgio Napolitano, think bigger about the next time you have to choose somebody to send over here as your ambassador. The other point about Napolitano that is interesting is that he was a lifelong leftist, as I say, a former communist. And yet he carved out a very close personal relationship with Pope Benedict XVI, who was, of course, the doyen, the hero of the Catholic right, not just in Italy, but around the world. Napolitano once wrote an essay for L'Osservatore Romano, the Vatican newspaper, the title of which was My Friend, Benedict XVI. And he said one of the greatest joys and the greatest privileges of his term as president of Italy was the opportunity to become friends with Benedict XVI. Benedict XVI, for his part, once said of Napolitano that Italy got very lucky to have someone of his caliber and his quality guiding the country in very difficult moments where there were obstacles on all sides. My point is that this friendship between Napolitano, the leftist, and Ratzinger, the perceived conservative, it stands as a towering counterexample to the hyperpartisan, toxic temper of our times. It is one that all of us would do well to ponder and just maybe to emulate. Finally this week, preview of coming attractions. 
Pope Francis later this week will begin what is perhaps going to be the most hyperactive period of his papacy. Let me just briefly tick off what we're going to be seeing in coming days. Saturday morning of the 30th of September, the Pope will preside over a consistory for the creation of 21 new cardinals, including 18 under the age of 80, and therefore eligible to take part in the next papal election. That evening, there will be an ecumenical prayer vigil in St. Peter's Square to pray for the success of the upcoming Synod of Bishops on Synodality. The Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople, Archbishop Justin Welby of Canterbury, and the leaders of roughly 50 different Christian confessions will be on hand. Romans of all stripes have been encouraged to participate, even in my little Roman parish, where the Vatican usually feels like it's on a different planet. Even we got a personal invitation to show up on Saturday and be there. Then, that night, after the the vigil wraps up, all of the roughly 400 participants in this coming synod are going to be bussed up to Sacrofano. That's a small, small town about an hour outside of Rome to the north where they will spend the next two days at the Fraterna Domus Retreat Center for a spiritual retreat in advance of the Senate, led by Dominican Father Timothy Radcliffe and Mother Maria Ignazia Angelini, former abbess of a fabled Benedictine monastery in Milan, and they will lead the Senate participants through a set of kind of spiritual exercises Then on October 4th, they all come back to Rome that morning, which is the Feast of St. Francis. Pope Francis will preside over the opening mass for the Synod of Bishops, which will be joined, concelebrated by all the new cardinals that he just named. That afternoon, the curtain rises on the Synod of Bishops on Synodality, and from then until October 29th, ladies and gentlemen, it is going to be prime time here in the Vatican as this moment, which is in some ways designed by Pope Francis to be the culminating moment of his legacy and his pontificate gets underway. We will have full coverage of all of this on the Crux site, so do be checking in. That is cruxnow.com. Again, cruxnow.com. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again very soon.